Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Franzen of SemanticWeb.com. We would like to thank you for joining us today for this webinar, a joint production between Dataversity and SemanticWeb.com with our speaker, Claude Nanjo of Cognitive Medical Systems. Today, Claude will be discussing achieving clinical knowledge convergence and interoperability. Just a few quick points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. Uh, for questions, however, we will collect those via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Please submit questions throughout the presentation, and we'll take some time at the end to uh, answer those. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. That email will go out to all registered attendees. A few words about our speaker today, Claude Nanjo. Claude is a software architect at Cognitive Medical Systems. He is also an active contributor to a number of HL7 and SNI clinical modeling initiatives, including Health eDecision, the Clinical Quality Framework, and Fast Health Interoperable Resources, which a lot of people know as FIRE. At both Cognitive Medical Systems and Zinc's Health, Claude has been involved in a number of research projects exploring the intersection between clinical decision support and the semantic web. Prior to joining Zinc's Health, Claude was engaged in research developing machine learning solutions to mine information on the web. Claude studied at the University of California, where he obtained a BS in biochemistry, a BA in history, as well as master's degree in public health and African area studies. Now, to get us started on today's main content, please allow me to introduce David Booth. David has been one of the primary organizers of the Yosemite Project. To help put today's webinar into the larger context of that project, here. Thank you, Eric. David, welcome. Hi, thanks, Eric. Um, so the Yosemite Project articulates a roadmap for achieving semantic interoperability of all structured healthcare information using RDF as a universal information representation. Uh, today's webinar by Claude Nanjo describes work that addresses step three of the Yosemite Project Roadmap. Step three is to define translation rules that allow healthcare instance data expressed in RDF to be automatically translated between different data models and vocabularies. And it relies on RDF's ability to capture information at any level of granularity using a standard representation that is readily amenable to translation and other forms of computation or reasoning. I had the privilege of collaborating with Claude on some of this work, and I think it is particularly interesting because it demonstrates not only the ability to use a variety of translation techniques on RDF healthcare data, but in doing so, it also lays the groundwork for allowing those translation rules to be shareable and eventually crowdsourced, as described in step four of the Yosemite Project Roadmap. So Claude, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Eric and David, for the introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, Eric, if you could make me presenter. All right. Have so, to all to you now, Claude. Thank you very much. So today I'll be talking about um, uh, a number of steps in order to be able to achieve a web of clinical knowledge and highlighting some of the experience that, um, as David mentioned, we've learned through a DOD project, uh, it was a research project, um, that uh, uh, focused in particular on the ability to uh, uh, load information from a clinical store of uh, the CHCS repository at the DOD and then process this information downstream for a number of purposes. So this presentation will start with an overview of the all too familiar healthcare challenge. And then I will discuss an approach for capturing and exposing clinical knowledge to support innovation and crowdsourcing in the hopes of mitigating some of these challenges. Then I'll provide a specific example focusing on the transformation and normalization of clinical content for a number of end uses, an example that leverage, uh, I'm sorry, an example that leverage RDF and, and an RDF pipeline. And I'll, I'll close this presentation highlighting steps uh, and activities that could get us closer to, to this vision. So I'll start here with a challenge. Uh, so the, the US healthcare system is, is really a mosaic of public and private payers 
public and private providers, and these can range from clinics, uh, which can be fairly small, to large tertiary healthcare centers. Um, and each organization, in turn, may use any number of different health IT systems and devices, any of which may or may not be able to communicate with the other. And yet, we know that most people will interface with a number of health institutions in a number of geographical locations numerous times in their lifetime. And we also know that care is better provided if the patient's uh, record spans the entire health history of the patient and not just the, the actual episode of care. And so this, this poses a dilemma. Now, another challenge is that, uh, and I'll call it the computability challenge, is that information is rapidly growing in healthcare and is outpacing our ability to keep up with it. So how do you bring the latest clinical evidence to the point of care? And um, another challenge, which uh, I call probably more the structural or semantic challenge, and it is that knowledge rapidly evolves in healthcare. And so in addition to just growing, it changes all the time. So how does one keep our knowledge bases current and not stale? And if it takes a lot of effort to be able to capture the information uh, and even more effort in order to maintain it, you know, keep it current, then <clears throat> this becomes a real challenge because knowledge bases will not be maintained because they will be too costly to maintain them over time. So what we want is exposed and richly linked knowledge. And, uh, and in particular, um, what we'd like to be able to have is knowledge that is computable that is reusable and that is actionable. And hopefully today we'll demonstrate some aspects of this. So in order to get there, there's actually a, a, a set of fairly simple uh, uh, steps that need to be taken. And uh, to most people who are familiar obviously with the web, I mean, this is fairly straightforward. But uh, in healthcare, actually, a lot of this is not being done. So I'll start with capture. And the challenge here is that we need interfaces that are intuitive to human users such as clinicians and SMEs, but these interface, but must also allow the capture of heterogeneous knowledge in a form that's computable by both machines and people. So, so that, 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 that's a challenge because um, this, of course, applies both to instance data, such as patient information, and declarative knowledge that can allow you to act on this data. And the key here is we really don't want to put, quote unquote, you know, semantics in the face of users. Ideally, we'd like for end users to really see what they're familiar with, and these interfaces should support that. But at the same time, these interfaces must be able to act as intersections between man and machine. And the capture should leverage, but not require, convergence towards common semantics by leveraging existing models and ontologies as much as possible. But at times it's not possible because there may not be models and there may not be ontologies or standards that support this. So there will always be some degree of capture of heterogeneous information that may not be covered by standards. And then capture should also preserve the rich linkages that exist between resources. So then once you've captured the information, then you want to be able to expose it. And this is really important to support innovations. So knowledge and data must be exposed ideally in addressable and self-describing ways. And so REST really provides a nice way to, to expose resources on the web and support many common data formats. So REST provides a few simple operations that can be applied on uh, a potentially infinite number of, of, of resources. And, but it's not just resources that can be exposed on the web. You can also expose logic uh, for example, as web services that can then be invoked by uh, any number of applications and could help foster innovation through the composition of services. So then um, if uh, one is to support the heterogeneous representation of knowledge and, and the exposure of that knowledge, then exposed resources will most likely need to be transformed. And um, so here you can see that uh, you might uh, have these resources being transformed from one form to another, and the output of these transformations could then be exposed again as resources as well, and, and this is an important point, as the transformations themselves. So if you are able to perform declarative transforms, so at least to represent your transformations declaratively, then these could be exposed for other organizations or other systems to use. And then once uh, you have uh, transformed data or exposed data, then you can process and analyze that data. 
And um, this knowledge can be used by any number of other clients for, for a large number of purposes. And this is really key to innovation. And in, in further slides, I'll give you some examples of what we did on the past project, but of course, uh, um, potential uses are bound. And then the output of these processes should ideally, again, be exposed to others. So this is what this arrow represents. Um, ideally, if we're going to spend a lot of time um, learning information about our content, we'd like to expose it as new knowledge. And then exposed knowledge and data should be actionable by both humans and non-human actors. So for example, clinical data may be summarized for clinicians at the point of care, through let's say reports and so on, or normalized patient data and declarative clinical rules could serve as input to clinical decision support systems that assist practitioners in the delivery of this evidence-based care. So ultimately, our goal is really to improve outcomes and patient satisfaction, and also to be able to provide more cost-effective care. So, so how, how do we really achieve this? So I would argue that this ecosystem actually already exists. Um, so if you look at the web, um, you can see there's a lot of uh, standards out there that can allow you to perform the steps that were out um, that were listed in the previous slide. So for example, you can capture knowledge using OWL. You can represent clinical information as RDF. Um, there's obviously a lot of web technologies that focus on interfaces and the ability to interact with human users uh, through, let's say, HTML5. And then, as mentioned also before, uh, REST allows you to uh, have simple uh, interfaces to potentially large numbers of resources on the web. And then cloud computing gives you tremendous computing power at your fingertips. But something to also keep in mind is this platform this is really based on technologies uh, that have been developed for the web. And the web is a highly successful platform that has really ushered the information age. And it is built on standards. It is highly accessible. It can support crowdsourcing. And, uh, but most important of all, it has really uh, um, uh, enabled tremendous innovation with applications that no one would have thought could be possible uh, just uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So now I would like to focus on some work that we did for the Department of Defense on a project called TAPS, which is essentially a number of investigations as the DOD is looking to potentially replatform its entire health uh, architecture. And in this project, we leverage RDF to normalize clinical data for downstream processing. So the next few slides will focus on a few aspects of this process. And in, in, in the next few slides, you'll see us focus particularly on the transformation and normalization of clinical data. So here is a, a, a visual representation of the TAPS RDF pipeline. And so in this project, we developed an RDF transformation pipeline, which is based on David Booth's RDF pipeline. And this pipeline illustrates one of the greatest challenges in health informatics, which is the exchange of heterogeneous health information, because as I mentioned before, patients are mobile and we need to be able to track the information about patients across their lifetime. And the TAPS RDF pipeline is essentially an RDF data flow engine that reads patient data represented as RDF graphs from CHCS, uh, which is an EHR used by the DOD. It's uh, based on the MOMS architecture. And uh, here we use its FileMan QL interface to be able to pull from CHCS patient data as RDF graphs. And then uh, I'm describing here four Sparkle transformations, which convert this proprietary RDF patient graph into a standards-based RDF graph. And so here you can see that we performed, uh, and here we're just highlighting essentially a transformation that takes the CHCS patient name and then aligns it to its to its FAR RDF equivalent. Uh, the same uh, we did for address, so very similar transformation. Um, and then there was a more complex transformation where we had to take medication uh, SIGs in CHCS and then convert them to their equivalent in FAR. And then the last one illustrates, a um, I'm sorry, a terminology alignment problem whereby we had needed to convert ICD-9 codes that were used to represent problems in CHCS to their SNOMED equivalent as recommended by the FHIR specification. For this, we use the FHIR RDF representation, which we developed uh, primarily for, for this project. And, um, and then the output of these four transformations, these, these, these uh, transformed graphs, were then merged 
uh, by another node and then persisted into a big data cluster of three nodes, uh, which was fronted by an interface that could allow that data not to be retrieved and used by downstream clients. And what's important to note here, that a lot of these transformations are sparkle, and each of these nodes could be performed independently on different endpoints. So here is an example of this uh, RDF pipeline. And um, what's uh, um, important to keep in mind here is that this is a declarative representation of, of an RDF pipeline. And um, it, it, it shows a number of nodes, um, including the, the nodes that perform the transformations. And uh, so I'll describe each one of these um, uh, briefly, but you can see the first node essentially reads a patient graph, an RDF graph from CHCS, and then it passes that patient graph to four trans nodes that perform the transformations. The uh, address transformation is performed by this node. This node performs the main transformation. This one performs the SIG transformation, and this one performs the ICD-9 to SNOMED transformation. And each of these nodes, as, as I mentioned before, could be executed on a different endpoint. And, um, and then the output, uh, the graph that results from the transformation are then merged by this node and then persisted into the big data cluster. So um, I won't have time to talk much about the pipeline in greater detail, but here I put a link. Uh, if you want to find out more about this pipeline, I highly recommend that you do. And uh, this pipeline was developed by David Booth, and, um, and perhaps during the discussion section, David could, could talk a little bit more about this pipeline. But um, uh, here, what you can notice is that this pipeline is declaratively represented. So this could also be exposed as a resource, along with all the transformations that I use as these different nodes. So these different nodes could pull the transformations made available as resources and then act on that information. So now I'll step you through some of the transformations just to illustrate uh, what we were doing. So here what you see on the left is a CHCS patient graph where, um, which contains the address fields. And you can see that this transformation is a fairly straightforward transformation. It's essentially a one-to-one -one transformation with a slight restructuring of the graph when we convert the CHCS data into fire data and the introduction of a blank node. Um, another thing to keep in mind here is that the generated graph maintains its relationship to the original data, and both of these graphs were persistent to the big data store, and this allowed you to uh, perform analytics if you needed to on normalized data, if this was important, or you could perform analytics on the original data because there's always the potential that during a transformation you could have some loss. Also, this transformation was done using Sparkle queries, um, and the Sparkle uh, representation, declarative representation of the transformation uh, is, again, a resource that can be exposed. So the next transformation shows the same process. Um, uh, so in other words, transforming the CHCS patient graph into a fire graph. But in this case, uh, we wanted to highlight a special case where the, even though this is RDF, the fire prescription has a six string uh, which represents how the, the medication should be uh, uh, prescribed and administered um, and dispensed. And so this information here is an unstructured string, or actually I should say a semi-structured string. And so in order to perform this transformation, we needed to be able to um, essentially learn the grammar by processing a large number of these, of these things and then parse this string based on this grammar and annotate each of the components and then uh, break up the components and normalize them as necessary in order to be able to build, to populate the equivalent fire graph. And um, so this is an example of a non-deterministic transformation. And actually, normally, so this, this is mostly done for illustration purposes. In reality, when you would do this, uh, you would probably involve a human actor just to make sure that the actual uh, representation in fire did actually match the string, because there's always a possibility of ambiguous parses. And in some cases, there were cases where we couldn't parse the string because the string was too unstructured. But for the most part, we were able, we were able to learn a regular grammar and actually uh, break up the string into its components. Now here, this is where it becomes very important to link back to the original uh, content because you want to be able to know the source of truth, uh, uh, which was the root uh, of the information that was uh, ultimately transformed. <laughs> 
So this is another example of a sparkle transformation. And this is actually a very interesting example because uh, here what we're trying to do is to take a CHCS condition uh, which is coded using uh, an ICD-9 code. And we want to be able to align it uh, with its NOMAD equivalent because this is what uh, FIRE specifies, what it recommends in, in the specification. So in addition to some restructuring of the graph, and this restructuring has to be done because of the way that FIRE represents codable, codable concepts, we also need to invoke a terminology alignment service that performs this alignment. So here is an example of the declarative representation of this, trans of this transformation to illustrate the approach that we have taken here. So this is essentially a Sparkle query that builds the fire graph based upon the CHCS input graph. But also what's important to note here is this uh, box, this rectangle, which shows the uh, federated query. So this is a Sparkle query that calls another endpoint to perform the terminology alignment. And the terminology alignment is done using SCOS. So all the mappings are contained uh, in this knowledge base as SCOS mappings, and then these uh, are invoked by this transformation um, in order to be able to replace the ITD9 term with the corresponding SNOMAD term in the, in the FIRE uh, RDF graph. And so this transformation, this Sparkle transformation, then can be exposed. And so the pipeline can now pull this information from a URI and then uh, load and configure itself so that it can actually perform this transformation. So <coughs> um, in the next few slides, I'd like to describe in greater detail some of the steps and the efforts um, uh, that are currently happening in this direction. And so here I'll describe some of the movement that's happening in the Spanish world and also some of the work that we did in TAPS and some of the challenges and areas that still need to be addressed. So earlier we mentioned the importance of capturing structured clinical information. So I thought I'd give a, a few examples. So of course, capture uh, can involve the capture of uh, patient information. So you could imagine in an EHR, you could have interfaces that allow clinicians to answer patient information on their uh, portable devices or on their computers. And, um, but there are other uh, types of captures that we need to keep in mind. So one example are, for instance, the capture of clinical knowledge in the form of evidence-based order sets. And these are important because they can help standardize care and encourage the adoption of evidence-based practice at the point of care in an accelerated manner. Uh, it is said that um, uh, new evidence, in order to make it to the point of care, could take up to 17 years to happen. They say that now, because of advances in computer technology and the fact that a lot of organizations are now moving towards electronic records, that this may have been uh, reduced to, let's say, uh, six or seven years, but that's still a long time. And then standard space and interoperable clinical rules uh, can also be captured in this way, and this can allow organizations to exchange clinical knowledge that can impact patient care. And then also other types of knowledge that can be captured, for example, are the mapping of synonymous terms like we showed earlier with the SCOS terminology alignment between different terminologies. And this can help organizations reduce the cost of exchanging clinical information. So what you see very often in the field is that organizations have uh, proprietary vocabularies, they have proprietary models, but then they need to, in, to exchange information or they get acquired by, by a larger organization and now they need to integrate into this ecosystem. And this is actually very costly to do so. But many of them are actually defining these models and these terminologies on top of their existing EHRs. So they may define this, for example, on top of Cerner or, or on top of Epic. And a lot of these EHRs provide essentially sort of uh, starting data models and starting terminologies that can be used for the, the, the authoring of this content and, and so on. And so if you can take these starting point uh, of vocabularies, for example, and then mapping to standard terminologies, then this is an effort that could be done once and could be leveraged by many organizations. So these are examples of the capture of clinical knowledge that can be reused for other purposes. So uh, why do we need uh, clinical standards to guide clinical captures? So I mentioned earlier that we wanted to be able to, as much as possible, uh, converge towards some uh, uh, semantics. Well, um, one example, and what we really have been stressing through uh, this, this series of talks, 
is that RDF makes the processing of clinical information quite straightforward. There's a lot of tooling available, and uh, it's a known semantic model with a number of supported representations. And so, um, and as we uh, demonstrated in, uh, for the DOD, we were able to perform these transformations uh, uh, quite easily once the data was represented in RDF. But um, also it's important to note that RDF cannot solve all problems. And transformations, even when done with RDF, are, are, are expensive. And they're hard to maintain. And when models change and terminology change, well, you, you might have to maintain some of these uh, representations, and, um, and, and, and this is expensive. And then transformations, as was illustrated with the SIG transformation, can be lossy and not always deterministic. So standards really allow you to converge on something. They provide um, essentially some of the common clinical baseline that you can converge on. And great strides have been made recently in the standards world. And I think the, the, one of the important uh, developments has been the development of the, the, the fast healthcare interoperability resources and the fact that now we have a common point where we can converge on. And, um, and they're not as hard as they used to be. So when you look at some of the earlier V2 standards, they were harder to understand in, in many cases. FAR is really an effort to move towards easier standards to, for clinicians and implementers to understand and, and, and implement in the real world. And, but another point I just wanted to uh, touch on briefly is that the customization and the localization of content, uh, even though it might be really beneficial in the sense that you can take standard content and you can normalize it for your local clinical culture, but what people are realizing now is that it really increases the total, the total cost of ownership because you never know when you need to exchange that data with other organizations and doing so, the more customized and the more localized it is, the more transformation costs you'll have. And if every organization customizes and normalizes data in a different way, then you actually greatly increase uh, the, the, the cost of exchanging this, this content. So there are a few encouraging developments um, that, that are happening. So one of them is uh, the adoption of fires I mentioned before. And so what I wanted to do here is to put a link for those who are interested and not so familiar with FHIRE. But FHIRE is really an implementation-friendly, resource-oriented REST approach um, to represent clinical resources. And then another interesting development um, is the formation of the RDF Semantic uh, Interoperability Subworking Group at HL7, which is a subworking group of the ITS working group. And its goal is to help expose HL7 standards using RDF and OWL. And um, right now, there are some discussions in terms of developing an OWL ontology for FHIRE and also a FHIRE RDF representation based on work from uh, Josh Mandel and Eric Perlomo. And um, But this effort is actually quite important because it represents the convergence of two communities, the HL7 community and also the W3C community, in particular, the healthcare and life sciences group community. So here is a link to the wiki if you want to find out a little more about um, the subworking group. Right now, the wiki doesn't contain too much information, but uh, it will be expanded shortly as this group uh, really has just started its activity. And a quick note to our attendees, we will post those uh, hyperlinks alongside the recording of this session and this slide deck. Thank you. So, so now, um, so once you have um, captured the information, as mentioned before, obviously you need to expose it because if you don't expose it, it can't really be used by a community um, on, uh, that that's, um, has access to the web. And, uh, but when you expose resources, the, one of the issues is that um, how, do, how do you find what you want and how do you trust that uh, what you're getting is actually good? And the, the web is, is really large, and we know how hard it is to find information today. If you do a search on Google, you may have to refine your search before you can find specific information, although I have to say uh, Google is actually quite good at this. And um, so the first part is finding the information. So in other words, resources that are exposed on the web need to be able to uh, exposed metadata that allows you to quickly narrow and narrow down and, and target your search and find exactly what you want. And what we really need is a type of innovation that we've seen on the web, which is um, very similar to, to Yelp, essentially approaches that allow you to um, uh, find ratings, find information about the quality of resources that are available. 
And um, uh, so the second part also is to be able to know how reliable um, the, uh, the information is. So in other words, what we'd like to know is uh, uh, not only whether the information is good, um, but um, uh, how, how trustworthy is the recommendation uh, about this information. And then we need to be able to retrieve this, this, this information um, and, um, and then so that we can use it. So for instance, when we were exposing the various transformations um, and let's say we're building an RDF pipeline, we'd like to be able to use essentially these type of, uh, of registries to find the transformations that we need um, and ideally, um, these transformations will be enriched with the right metadata that would allow you to, to quickly locate them and then, uh, then incorporate and configure our pipeline so that they can use that information as much as possible or export services that are relevant, uh, especially in, 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 in the healthcare area. Um, so then uh, here's another slide that shows um, the, uh, an Amazon um, uh, bookseller list uh, which uh, sell a particular book. And I think what's really important also is that if you expose information on the web, you really want to be able to know the pedigree of that information. And so here you see two bookstores like Now Book Company and Bookman's Exchange, and they both have uh, fairly high ratings, almost equivalent ratings. But if you look at the second one, it has over 174,000 ratings. And so this is a really important metric in order to uh, determine that the artifact that you've exposed um, uh, comes from a source that has high pedigree. And, uh, and this is going to be really important for evidence-based content because as you expose this information on the web, um, you, you, you really want to be able to know that you're trusting the sources, that they're using a good process to uh, extract evidence from existing periodicals, and that they actually are representing it in a way that's accurate. So uh, here are some other encouraging developments on that front. So here, this is just a nod to the ONC's Clinical Quality Framework Initiative. And this is an important initiative because um, essentially it represents the harmonization of clinical decision support models and clinical quality models uh, that are used for the, uh, for the authoring uh, of clinical quality measures through FHIR. And these are important because um, first, uh, they represent uh, more convergence towards common models. So you can see here, there was a, a model called the VMR and another model called the quality data model, which are not going to be represented as FHIR profiles. And then in the future, there might be a CDS ontology that could um, essentially be uh, um, uh, aligned with, with these profiles uh, for clinical decision support, for tooling, and so on. And then another uh, important development um, uh, that I would just wanted to, to briefly mention is uh, a new effort that's recently been started called the CDS Collaborative, which is a collaboration between the University of Utah and Cognitive Medical System uh, in terms of making available an open source platform for clinical decision support and also ultimately to expose a number of declarative rules as artifacts that could be brought in uh, on the, uh, um, to configure a pipeline such as um, uh, the RDF pipeline that you saw uh, in, the, in the previous slide. So then um, uh, part of the task project, what we also did uh, was to uh, take information um, from, uh, read information from the big data cluster. So these were patient graphs that we normalized at FHIR and, uh, and perform uh, a number of operations on this information. And so here I wanted to briefly highlight some of these. Um, so one thing that we did, uh, another uh, prototype, uh, consisted of taking uh, so the, the same CHCS data that we normalized um, using the, the, the fire transformations, as well as information from another EMR, which could be VISTA, for instance, um, and illustrate how you could take these graphs. And then once you load them into the big data store, because the information is uh, referenced uh, by unique URIs, then you would get the uh, automatic ag aggregation of the patient record. And this, this, this is important because then what we did is we loaded the normalized patient, uh, RDF patient graph from the big data repository in Hadoop and then performed a number of map reduce operations in order to generate uh, a set of features, so feature vectors, that we can then pass to a patient cohort classification system to classify patients into different cohorts. And so um, by doing this, we're able to identify patients who are at risk and not at risk for PTSD and add these additional facts back into uh, the big data uh, triple store. 
And then the output of this patient cohort classification system, which was enabled because we were able to take these uh, uh, patient graphs and proprietary representations and normalize them as file representations, could then be used by uh, a PTSD capacity planner prototype that could then uh, make uh, uh, forecasting, resource forecasting assumptions based upon the, the percent of the population uh, or the, the, the number of people who might be returning from Iraq and Afghanistan who could be at risk for PTSD and ensuring that organization had the capacity to be able to care for this population. So ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to um, uh, take the knowledge that is in people's heads and expose this information as resources and services, um, and then compose these to address core challenges in healthcare. So uh, another example here is this, uh, the example that I mentioned about the aggregation and normalization of the federated patient records from the VA and the DOD uh, could then be used by clinical decision support system on, uh, on this new unified longitudinal patient record. And so one of the demonstrations that we had done in, in the previous uh, prototype um, was to show how patient data um, that uh, might be obtained from both the VA and the DOD, where in the DOD, for instance, that data uh, had information about allergies, whereas the VA record did not. And by uh, taking these two records, um, essentially um, uh, uh, transforming them using uh, an RDF transformation, to uh, the normalized fire representation, we were able to generate an alert that um, uh, uh, warned the clinician when the medication that the, person, uh, that the patient was allergic to was prescribed to, to, to that patient. Now the hope, of course, is by exposing knowledge declaratively and by making APIs more open and standard, one can ultimately foster the same degree of innovation that has accompanied the growth of the wild in healthcare. But uh, um, it'll take time to get there, and it'll require really the efforts of both the public and the private sectors to get there. But above all, and this is really our ask to the community, is we'd like to ask you to help us get there and to get involved in initiatives. I think the more community participation we have, the better. And really, if you can, try to engage the community and participate, and um, also contribute as much as you can in your applications and your work to open link knowledge. Thank you. Claude Nandro, thank you so much. Uh, turn to our attendees now, and uh, please do line up your questions in that Q&A box. Um, while we are waiting for people to do that, Claude, a quick question to you and to David Booth. David, if you want to weigh in. Um, what are some specific ways that people can get engaged with the community? Are there uh, specific uh, websites that they ought to be going to or things that they should, actions that they could take in immediately to participate? Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, and, and David, please, please weigh in. Um, so I would suggest, if, especially if you're involved in um, some of the challenges facing healthcare, a good place to start is to look at the standards and interoperability uh, site, the wiki that's available. These are initiatives from the ONC, and uh, generally these initiatives um, are done in conjunction with Health Level 7, which is a standard development organization. Um, another place uh, to, to go to is HL7 itself and to look at the, the various sub-working group and see what they're working on and to uh, uh, find any area that might be interesting to you that you'd like to participate. And on the slide back, there was an example of the sub-working groups that uh, David Booth is leading. And, um, um, and obviously on the W3C side, um, there are a number of ways to get involved. And I think uh, in this case, I'll let David uh, weigh in. Yeah, well, I, I want to stress, too, that um, we are working on this uh, HL7 subgroup on RDF for semantic interoperability, and this is not a closed effort, so anyone who is interested is invited to participate, and I would very much encourage uh, those who are interested to participate. Uh, if you want to participate in a somewhat more passive uh, role, it's good to sign up to the W3C Healthcare and Life Sciences Interest Group mailing list, uh, because you can kind of keep abreast of some of the activities there that are going on as well. So in addition to the other things that uh, Claude mentioned, I think those are two good things. Great. 
Uh, we have our first question here. Uh, have you found the concept of terminology and interoperability difficult to sell to stakeholder groups at different levels? What strategies have you used to promote the value? So I would say that I think the, the, the concept of, at least in the world that I'm living in, uh, the, the concept of terminology alignment and uh, um, uh, the need for interoperable models and representation of information, um, I think, has been pretty much sold. I think the issue now is to be able to really make the case uh, across the vendor community and across the broader community about the importance of doing so, and also uh, making it known really to health care organizations that are configuring uh, their health systems that are moving more and more towards electronic representation of clinical information about uh, the cost of customizing and localizing information uh, to meet their needs. And uh, we see a lot of organizations, well, there were really two reasons why organizations uh, were doing this. So first of all is because a lot of organizations say, well, you know, we have that special stuff, that special ingredient. And our local uh, representation of knowledge really helps us deliver better care. And, and I think that's really important, and, and that should be encouraged. But I think uh, organizations also have to realize the, the cost of that unique representation and whether at all times this is really necessary. And I think you're starting to see organizations that are really understanding that this is actually really, really costly, and it makes it really difficult to keep content current over time, especially if you want to take in content, let's say, from uh, the Zinxes or the Walter Screwers of the world uh, who spend a lot of time looking at evidence-based content. Um, if your content is highly proprietary, you'll need a lot of transformation to be able to ingest this content, and you won't be able to keep it current. But another problem I think that has happened is that there hasn't been really out there a lot of good models that people could converge to. And I remember when I was working at Zinc, a lot of organizations would ask, well, do you have something that you could converge on? And so I think with the development of FIRE, with the development of the CQS initiative and so on, we are starting to get these core models that people can converge on and can customize on the fringes. And I think this is going to go a long way towards um, uh, moving a lot of organizations towards better interoperability and towards better terminology alignment. At, at least that's, that's my, my take on this. Um, I want to add that uh, the President's Council of uh, Advisors on Science and Technology, so-called PCAST, uh, the, their 2010 report very clearly identified the national need for uh, interoperability of healthcare information. <coughs> specifically called that out as, a, as an important need. And the Yosemite project arose in part in response to that identified need, that very clearly identified need. So I think Claude is right that, that the need is pretty well established and pretty well recognized now. All right, next question. Um, do you, either of you have a recommended representation standard for biomarker data? So this is not really uh, uh, a strong area of expertise for me. Uh, David, I'm, I'm not sure you might know more about this. Well, let's see. I, I, don't, I don't know specifically, um, uh, but there, there are lots of ontologies now in the BioPortal site. Um, so I would strongly recommend taking a look at the BioPortal site. Uh, there probably is something there. Uh, I know I have recently been using a, an ontology dealing with, uh, with bioassays, uh, but there's quite, a, there's quite a variety of <clears throat> biomedical ontologies in the BioPortal site now. So if you look up BioPortal, uh, you, you, that's a great place to start. And one thing I just wanted to mention briefly um, uh, to Jadeep and to others, um, is that the fact that there are many bioontologies that are arising today and also uh, the realization that uh, obviously our genetics uh, can impact our, our health is really important. And I think that's why we need to, when we think in terms of modeling clinical data, to think of the open world, the fact that even though today clinical models represent information in a particular way, 
when you are defining ontologies uh, on top of standards and you're defining uh, uh, semantic representation of clinical information, you really want to be mindful of this open world where you could use, for example, particular genetic information about a patient to know whether the slow metabolizers of particular medications, which could in, uh, in fact impact the dosage of the medication that you recommend for this patient, given that new fact that you have that has been uncovered uh, by a lot of the movement in, in, in biotechnology. Great. So the next question, uh, the next questioner says, I think you mentioned that there was some work on creating an ontology <laughs> for fire. Can you comment on that? How far along is it? And is anything available for looking at? So uh, there, there are a number of resources that uh, uh, you can look at today. So I would say this is still a very early effort. Uh, it's, it's, there's nothing sort of uh, that can be called a formal uh, accepted uh, ontology for fire. And there's a lot of discussion happening right now in terms of what's the best approach to uh, um, modeling fire semantically. And, um, and whether this should be a very low-level ontology that resembles closely the way FHIR is being structured today, or whether it's a slightly higher, more conceptual ontology that represents FHIR resources, or whether possibly you need both and they need to be bridged. So th th there's a lot of discussion. I would highly encourage that if you're interested in this, you join us at the RDF subwarting group. Uh, we have a meeting uh, on on Tuesday where actually I'll, I'll be uh, describing some of the work I've been doing. And we had two meetings which described the efforts of uh, other folks, uh, Tony Malia, who had a very interesting approach to looking at the fire ontology, also work done by Josh Mandel and Eric Colomo in terms of a NARDF representation of fire. And um, so now is an exciting time to get involved uh, because there's a lot of discussions about it. And um, what we anticipate is that in the near future, there's going to be quite a bit of development on that front, and we're really hoping to be able to provide and work with the fire team uh, to provide a uh, RDF representation of fire that could be included in the fire standard. And uh, this is David Booth. I'm putting in the, the chat window or the, the question Q&A window a link to the agenda for Tuesday's call, which we'll discuss uh, uh, the the fire ontology and uh, uh, the creation of a fire ontology and different approaches. Bob <laughs> will actually be talking about an approach that he took on uh, Tuesday. So I would encourage Thank anyone you, to join. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Good resource. Thank you. Yep. Um, on your last slide, Claude, you, you talk about uh, people contributing to open linked knowledge and uh, the next question, someone has Googled open linked knowledge and didn't find anything. Is there a specific URL? You want to yeah, and I, uh, so there's actually no URL, and really, uh, maybe I should yeah. capitalize this. Uh, so what I really meant is um, when when you are working um, and and uh, developing solutions, especially solutions that use uh, semantic technologies and elegant solutions that use semantic technologies, um, it would be great if you can, and if you're in a position where you can to uh, share that world, uh, uh, that work uh, with, with with the rest of the community. And so this is really what I meant by that. And so an example is at Cognitive, the company I work for, we're very much committed to open source and we really want to be able to uh, make available um, essentially these, um, these, these uh, tools, uh, clinical decision support services, resources and so on, uh, and make them available using Apache licenses so that other organizations can use them uh, as they need. And this is really what I meant by that. Okay. Great. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you so much, Claude. Claude Nanjo, uh, David Booth, thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, this is a great presentation, great Q&A session. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Just to remind everyone, uh, we will be posting the recorded webinar from today and the slides to semanticweb.com by end of day Tuesday. And I will send a follow-up email to all of the registrants to let you know about the links and other information about how to access those. Part five of this webinar series about the Yosemite Project will take place one week from today, December 12th, 2014. And you will receive an email with registration details about that. Um, 
I've also posted a slide here uh, telling you about the final two episodes in the Yosemite Project series. Uh, hopefully you can uh, jot that down, and if not, you'll be redirected when you log off from this to a place where you can get more information. Thank you again for attending today's webinar, everyone. Thanks again to Claude and David, and I hope you have a great day, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everyone.